It's great to welcome to the program today Liz Wall, who is a journalist, speaker, former RT television anchor, now a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives representing Texas's 23rd district, which is a swing district. And we will talk about that as a reminder for context, Liz, my audience may remember you from my favorite RT television interview ever with a pro North Korean Westerner who are sort of hard to find. Let's take a quick look at that interview so we all are on the same page. Well, we here at RT want to take the time to ask questions that aren't really being brought up in the aftermath of the failed launch. Jason, Jason Adam Tonis is the chairman of the North American Du Shangan Ideas Group, and he joins me now for more. Um, welcome there, Jason. Um, so a lot of hype, uh, nonstop coverage about this rocket, but is it possible that the fears are exaggerated? Of course they are. I mean, this was just a satellite launch, something that the U.S. government does all the time, Europeans do, Russians do, Chinese, Japanese. So why is it every other country can do this but not the DPRK? Um, and why not? Um, I mean, for example, several other countries have launched similar rockets, and no one really cares. Why is it portrayed as the end of the world when North Korea launches one? Exactly. It's all because... The, the United States government and the, the other countries that are under the financial dominance of the USA fear the DPRK because it is a Juche socialist state whose very systemic existence is seen by the American authorities as a threat to their economic system. Um, so we, any, any progress it makes. And Adam, we can any also... Progress, uh, go ahead. I apologize. Any, any, any progress Korea makes is seen as threatening to, to the American re regime because ultimately the American regime fears that if more American people find out about the DPRK's progress, they'll want the same system the DPRK has to be implemented in this country. And Jason, can we also look at this as North Korea trying to gain respect for them launching a rocket uh, gives them a sense of, of national pride. Well, of course, having a satellite program gives any country national pride, but I don't think Korea really needs any more respect from the rest of the world. The fact that a country doesn't need to be treated good by the rest of the world to gain legitimacy, the only thing it needs to gain legitimacy is the respect of its own people. Um, but don't you think that they would want respect, at least, um, you know, as a show that, hey, um, all these other countries can have these rockets. Why can't we? Of course they do. Of course. And so, Jason, um, w would you say then it, it should be their national right to have a weather satellite like so many other states do. Um, the United States has hundreds of satellites, so um, in the way, can it kind of be a double standard? Exactly, exactly there is a double standard. Every country has the right to do what it needs to do to improve itself. You know, with the DPR, why, shouldn't, why should the DPRK be treated any differently from any other country? Okay, um, Jason, uh, another thing, uh, the, the backlash of this is now the U.S. Has, has declared that they are going to stop giving food aid to North Korea. And, and this is food that feeds a lot of hungry people. And so um, do you think then that is it a wise decision to politicize this um, when the consequences um, will lead to uh, or in other words, politicize something um, that will, in the end, take food aid away over, over a weather satellite? Well, there's two things to, to consider. Number one, the whole food situation in, in the DPRK is overhyped. There is no famine in the, in the DPRK. People have enough to eat. While of course they would like to have more food aid. You don't. Well, sorry, you don't think that there. Not going to you don't think that there is any famine there. Is that what you just said? No, there is no famine in North Korea. No. There is not. Uh, People have enough to eat. Jason, how, how do you how do you know that? Well, I, I'm in communication with people in the DPRK every day, and they inform me as to the the actual realities of 
life in the country there. I speak to people there all the time. They tell me that everyone has enough to eat. It's, it's, you speak it's obvious. I mean, go there yourself. Uh, to go to North Korea, I, I think it's pretty difficult to go to North Korea, um, especially as a journalist. It's very difficult to report on what's going on there. Well, I imagine there are difficulties due to the fact that the government is uh, afraid of spies infiltrating the country, but if you were to honestly go there and report the situation, you would see that people there have a very high standard of living there. Okay, so Liz, I mean, let's just work forward to you running in the 23rd district of Texas, starting with how on earth did that interview happen? Like, the, does someone come to you and say, hey, we found this kid who loves North Korea, let's interview him? Or like, how does this go down? Essentially, yeah, that was one of the weirdest moments, I think, working there. They say that they cover voices that are ignored by the mainstream media, and I guess that would be an example of one, because um, that's not a point of view that you hear very often. Um, that one was particularly interesting because that came straight from the Russian news director, and I think he scoured the internet to try to find somebody with an alternative point of view. I did not pre-interview pre this gentleman, so him coming on the air, I only got his name and his affiliation live on the air, and then the dude pops up and I'm like, what is going on? Why is this guy on the show? Um, trying to go, trying to go with the questions that were pitched to me by the, the, the news director. And then it just obviously went very off the rails. And I was like, this, this guy's unwell. And he's saying there's no famine in North Korea. And it was, <laughs> Got very, very bizarre. So explain the dynamics saw. of because you said the, the Russian news director came to you with it. One of the things that we often hear from from people at not just RT, but at a lot of these networks that are sort of state affiliated is, listen, no one ever really tells me what to do. It's just I'm able to do what I do and I do it the way I want to do it. And we, we I've never been told I need to have this person on or espouse this point of view. This was someone came to you with this. This was not something you wanted to do. No, absolutely not. Um, this was something that was, well, we knew that we were doing a segment on North Korea and this was uh, the, you know, this wasn't a, a guest that I chose. This one at this, this time, that particular interview was chosen by, by the news director. So um, Larry King, interestingly, works for RT at the moment, I believe. Yeah. And, um, and he has been an advocate of saying that he is not, uh, told what to say or what to do. And in a lot of ways, I think that's, th there is some truth to that. But if you, it's, I, I what's troubling is RT now is almost indistinguishable uh, from Fox News. They're essentially, their narratives overlap, the attack on the establishment, on our institutions, on the mainstream media, all of that. Um, it's been very stark for me to see um, the way that this media narrative has overlapped. And now we have the president of the United States that we have an investigation where uh, a special counsel is looking into his ties to Russia and more uh, evidence is coming out that shows that in, that is indeed uh, what had happened. Um, 17 of our intelligence agencies has have unanim unanimously come to the conclusion that Russia helped to get President Trump elected by way of disinformation and cyber meddling. And we know that that's continuing to happen. Um, and it's been very, very stark for me because I ended up quitting in kind of a very high profile way in 2014. And um, yeah, well, let's not jump ahead. I want to get to that. But, but before okay. we get to that, you mentioned something that's interesting, which is the sort of similarity to, with, with some of the things that we see at Fox News. Here's what I would love to get your take on, because my I hear often both from people at Fox News I've spoken to and from people at RT that I've spoken to. No editor ever tells me what to say or what stories to do or how to say it. And as you say, in many cases, there is truth to that. What I think is missing from that story and tell me if I'm onto something is that if you are hired by one of these channels, you've already been pre-selected because you bring something that they find to be in line with whatever narrative or positioning is useful to them so that it's not necessary for you to be managed on a story by story basis. 
That is true. Um, for example, they would hire for the opinion hosts. You know, if you're on Fox News, you're going to have Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity, who's going to who is going to toe the line and is going to espouse conspiracy theories now, um, taking a page out of the Russian Russian television uh, playbook. And um, but then you'll have people like Chuck Smith that you know he is able to for the sake of legitimacy. So uh, it, back in 2011, a lot of the stories that we were covering did fit into that mold of, okay, well, we need to do legitimate reporting, and you can certainly do reporting that um, makes the U.S. look bad or report on shortcomings in our, in our system and in, um, in our government and so on and so, so forth that are 100 percent true. Um, but I think that it's since 2014 – it has, it has the type, the way that it's been propagandized and the aggressiveness of it. And, and this isn't just in the United States. I've done a lot of traveling uh, over in Europe um, and our allies are very concerned that Russian meddling by way of new, you know, people get informed. It's in, it through, through uh, largely through social media through new media, through digital media. Um, that's why Russia invests in 2014 in something called the a troll farm, where they try to affect the psychology of the population of, of a country. Um, and my observation back then is that they really had, they really tried to amplify the voices of the extremes. Um, so with Trump, you know, uh, amplifying the far right in some cases, actual uh, people with Nazi affiliations. Um, and we saw in 2016, uh, Bernie Sanders went on RT after, after the deluge of, of, uh, media reports that I helped to spur on Russian disinformation. So, um, so you could see the way that they push the extremes. And the reason why they do that is because it divides America. When you have people all the way over here and all the way over there, you're not going to be able to come to any kind of consensus to come to any bipartisan. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other you know? thing is just because so, OK, um, RT has one narrative and the programming is based to further that narrative. It's ter totally legitimate to say Fox News also has a motivation and a narrative and a big picture plan and profit is part of it. So in the same way that RT makes programming decisions with one set of priorities, it's totally fair to be critical of CNN for a bias to sensationalism that drives ratings or Fox News for whatever it is. But the, the point is, we have to understand that there either way there is a narrative and it's a matter of figuring out which one are you either willing or unwilling to be a participant in. It's not an objective determination as to which is good or bad, but ignoring the fact that it's real is what the problem I have is. Well, I think I think that you bring up something very important because there's I think we're losing sight of the difference between fact and opinion and a lie or a distortion. Uh, Fox News now. I mean, we have Sean Hannity spreading conspiracy theories. He spread the Seth Rich conspiracy theory, this whole deep state thing, um, uh, so forth and so on. And you know, it's a. a one thing also that is troubling to me is the way uh, conspiracy theories have been kind of um, integral to to Russian media, because there's this kind of, I'm like, what? Like, why? For example, there was one host that was came from a 9-11 truther background. And it's like, well, what advantage does Russia have by, by spreading conspiracy theories, nonsense conspiracy theories? Um, because at the end of the day, not everybody has to believe in every element of a conspiracy theory, but it's to kind of break down that trust in our government, in our institutions, in our media, in the system, to try to galvanize people to overthrow the system and uh, create these divisions within our own country. And I think we're seeing that today in our own politics. Um, it's divided, our country is more divided or along, even the comparison I think is, is troubling since the civil war. Um, and that, and that's something that has been a goal of, of Russian media and a goal of our foreign adversaries. And I think other adversaries like Iran and Russia are taking notes and saying, um, and seeing how they can use new media to divide America from within and to make it so um, they prop up people that are um, 
on either extreme end of the political spectrum and um, and make it so we're not able to progress or unite as a country, but to be divided from within and to be divided from our allies. Yeah, and I mean, I this is literally out of the 1997 book Foundations of Geopolitics as to how to sort of further unrest within a country. And media is obviously obviously a part of that. Now, what was the so you you, as you said, you prominently, very loudly uh, resigned your position at RT on air during during a segment. What what can we say about what happened after that in terms of how it impacted your career and sort of what the feedback and blowback was? Yeah, um, I mean, it's I mean, I think I'm, I'm proud that I did it. It was certainly not easy because this was around. This was in 2014. So um, a lot of people were not aware of what dis Russian disinformation was, the way that troll and bot systems operate. So it was very difficult to deal with that um, kind of people spreading like people. Um, the, it's they're called useful idiots where essentially Russia uh, will, will amplify people that are that will already spread hateful content or have anti-NATO, anti-EU, anti-American beliefs or, or conspiratorial beliefs. And so this is kind of this this elaborate system where people will try or where Russians, the Russian troll farm and their directors will try to discredit good people. Um, and in the case of the 2016 election, um, they amplified Trump because they thought, well, I mean, if they want to get Trump elected, you have to ask why. Probably because it's not in the best interest of our country. Um, and so that was difficult for me, I think, because there wasn't a lot of awareness uh, in the U.S., it was more so if you go to Europe and the Baltic countries, for example, uh, where Russia is right there, they're very keenly aware of, of this type of information warfare, essentially. Uh, they call it hybrid warfare, where you know you don't have to use guns or weapons or traditional modes of, of military force, but you can, use, you, can war you can use words, you can use media, you can use technology. Uh, you can win over hearts and minds, um, so you don't need to, you don't need to, uh, resort to other traditional tactics to influence the, the policy of other countries. So I think, um, so, I mean, so that you, you had asked about that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking now, um, where we stand today in 2019, I am very proud of the fact that I stood up and was able to bring attention to that. It certainly hasn't been easy. Um, you know, I've been attacked by all, you know, um, my character has been, has been, try, uh, been attacked. Uh, my motivations have been attacked. Um, but at the end of the day, um, but it also, it, it also provided me a platform and an opportunity to spread awareness about um, what I believe is one of our top national security issues. And that is our, that our democracy is under attack. And this is coming from our U.S. intelligence agencies. And it's been reiterated recently. And um, 2020 is coming around and they're going to try the same tactics. They're probably going to try to hone them and they're going to use new technology to the best of their advantage to influence and meddle in our politics. So we need to be aware of that and do what we can as as citizens, as journalists, as um, leaders, government leaders, spread awareness on this as tech companies also um, to understand that this is part of um an assault on our democracy and trying to meddle in our sovereign elections. And along those lines, uh, you are now a candidate in Texas's 23rd district. There's this uh, sometimes here in Boston, we might just assume that all of Texas is just red and very, very red. But actually, there are um, purple and even some sort of bluish enclaves in Texas. So talk about this. Is this uh, uh, what what is your approach for this campaign? And what in particular about that 23rd district is an interesting place for people who are more progressively minded to run? Well, I think uh, what's I mean, one thing that makes this district uh, noteworthy and important is um, it is it's a swing district, so it's winnable. Uh, Texas picked up a few seats in Congress in the, this last midterm election. Um, I think Texas is going, it's, some say it's purple. I think it's only a matter of time due to demographics. Um, young people are, are, are going to get older. And um, my, this district in particular is 70% Hispanic. It is a border district. It's a swing district. So um, I think it's absolutely a way to, um, it's, it's up for grabs, essentially. 
Um, and I think in this Trump era, come 2020, that we need to have all hands on deck and we need to get as many Democrats um, in Congress to serve as a check on the executive branch, as a co-equal co -equal branch of government. And we need people to start, and, and, and you know, of course I believe in progressive platforms in terms of, you know, when it comes to healthcare, preserving the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, helping to, to boost the middle class, all of those things. But I'm not going to be shy in saying that I believe that our democracy is under attack um, and that we need to be more aggressive in exposing that and, and communicating that to the public. Because I think largely a lot of the public doesn't understand the extent to which the Mueller investigation has produced uh, indictments um, and has linked activity on high levels to, to Russia. Um, so, to, uh, so I think that we need to be able to communicate that to the country that our, our democracy is under attack and the law is at stake in 2020. And, um, and I decided I live here now, it's home. Um, and because it's a seat that is winnable and because I am so passionate about these issues and, um, you know, woke up in 2016 after the election, um, very distraught, kind of having watched the way the campaign played out, knowing and seeing, you know, Paul Manafort, Mike, Michael Flynn, just the way that the Russian narrative and the GOP narrative started to co-mingle, like they, 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 were, they were one, it was one narrative. And then it's been a disaster ever since. Um, our country's divided. In El Paso, actually, uh, President Trump is going to be there on Monday. Yes. He will be giving, uh, I guess he'll be holding a rally to support the wall. I don't know. Well, I don't know if you, people are going to be bussed in, but there isn't support for the wall in, in El Paso. I spoke to um, a representative from the uh, Texas Democratic Party there in El Paso. Um, they are expecting protests, and I do plan on being there. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, apparently, uh, President Trump thought San Antonio, there, that, we, that we had walls around San Antonio, <laughs> which there's not. I can confirm that. Um, yes, uh, not, a, not, a, not exactly the most uh, geographically um, uh, well-versed president, I think is, uh, is fair to say. Well, I think that the, the Turn Texas Blue movement is an interesting one that we've been following and, and will continue to. Uh, but for today, we've been speaking with Liz Wall, journalist, speaker, former RT television anchor, now running for the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 23rd district in Texas. Check out my website, LizWall.com, and it's Wall, W-A-H-L. Um, so that's the wall. Um, this is so cheesy, but um, somebody uh, request, uh, had suggested <laughs> the only wall Texas needs. But um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but let's go check it out. Thanks, Liz. <laughs>